this morning during our worship service, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. So uh, for those who aren't here physically with us and are joining us online, feel free to grab um, a cracker, some bread, and, and, and something to drink so that you can participate with us during that service. The second thing I just wanted to give you all a heads up on is that during the time of gratitude, before we take our offering and have the doxology, uh, I'm just going to take a moment to uh, acknowledge the fact that in the Christian Church's All Saints uh, Day just passed, and this is All Saints Sunday, a Sunday when uh, Christians take an opportunity to acknowledge those who've gone before us and who had a great influence in our lives. Uh, we're not talking about just, you know, the Apostle Paul uh, or any of the disciples, but we're talking about friends, relatives, uh, family, uh, parents uh, who were great role models for us all. And I'm going to invite the congregation at that time to share uh, names of anyone they'd like to remember uh, and acknowledge during our time of gratitude. For those now, if you'll join me in the call to worship, adopted from the 145th Psalm. I will exalt you, my King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every, Every day, day we will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. God's greatness to no one can fathom. Nation, and your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and we will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing your righteousness. Slow to anger and rich in love. If you'll join me in our gathering hymn, number 55, Rejoice, ye pure in heart. You could join me in our opening prayer. Eternal and loving God, we have come from many different places and from various walks of life. It is a bit of a mystery to us that our paths have intersected 
as we join together to worship and praise you. In our worship this day, help us to understand that your ways are broader and sometimes very different from human ways. Things that often concern us have no importance in your realm. Help us to stop trying to limit you to our perspectives and ways, and instead enable us to trust in your will and your way, and to open our hearts to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. By doing so, renew our spirits and grant us the courage to face all the challenges of this realm. We ask this in all things in the name of our Lord and Savior, praying as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. seated, and if the children would like to join me uh, in the front of the church, in the sanctuary here. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Okay, and you all know who I am, right? Right, so you're going to be incredibly disappointed when you find out that I brought something here to share with you today that is not edible. <laughs> Oh, for shame, for shame, for shame. He didn't get the email or the text message telling him what to do today, did he? Yep, they're getting the nods like, oh my gosh, he's just, we just don't know what to do with him. And we just, you know, don't think there's any hope for him whatsoever. I brought something very magical to share with you today. Ooh, yes, okay. Come on, let's go. Come on, car. Ooh, okay, very good. Okay, sound effects are very important here. I have something from when I was a kid that was very, very popular, okay? So we had more than sticks and rocks to play with, okay? Maybe it didn't quite have the things that you have, but we had something that was considered very, very magical, okay? Anyone want to guess what magic I brought today? Maybe they could tell from the back of the box. These, you know, these kids are way too ahead of me. Okay, so guess... A slime? Nah, not slime. Okay, Jenna. Something that you scratch? No, not quite. What I brought? Oh, okay. Something that's fuzzy. Okay, no. Okay, it give you a hint. It's something you wear. Ooh. What's that? Headbands. Not quite. Okay, it's something that you, okay, yes? A wig. a wig. Well, yeah, I need that, but not quite today. Okay, all right, okay. No, and quite, the wig I would need would not fit into this box, okay? So what I brought is something that you wear to, this is going to sound weird, though, to tell you how you're feeling. And, okay, Sierra? Mood bracelets, we're getting close there. Okay, so you do want to, oh wait, okay, so the three of you, I think all three of you have the same answer, I bet. Do you want to share the answer together and then, okay, tell each other what you think the answer is, tell each other. Okay, and the answer is? All right, so we have world's famous mood rings. Okay, all right, so here we go. So each of you gets to take a mood ring today because we want to know how your mood is today, right? We are, just, we are just incredibly concerned about you today here in church. 
And we're going to ask you to put your mood ring on once you take it. You notice that each of them has a different kind of symbol on them. And so you get to pick the one you want. And these probably came out of the 60s, so there's a peace sign, and yeah, right, exactly, come on, you know, it's like, hey, you know, these came right out of my drawer from the 60s and haven't been touched since then. All right, here we go. You want to take two? Yeah, you got to take one for each of you. There we go, he knows what he wants, there we go. All right. Uh-oh. You, you lose your mood ring and you won't know how you feel. That's, that's, that's the problem. All right. Okay, so everybody's got their mood ring on, right? Okay, so I'll just put one on just for, you know, see, see how I'm feeling here today, too. And I know you adults are just all jealous because you don't have a mood <laughs> ring for today. All right? You don't know how you feel. Okay, so here is what my codes say. Okay, if it's yellow which I hate to say it, I'm yellow, I'm uneasy. <laughs> Very uncomfortable. I have no idea what I'm go where I'm going with this children's sermon. It was not yellow when I tested it yesterday. Yesterday, I was very, very kind of grayish blue, which meant I was calm. Okay, if you're green, you're sensitive. Ooh, okay. Anybody sensitive here? Okay, so we have a sensitive one here. All right, okay. Okay, uh, anybody have purple? Yeah. Okay, you're happy. All right, purple means you're happy. See, I told, hey, amazing, huh? Just, yep, you are happy. All right. Okay, anybody, uh, okay, anybody yellow, which I'm the yellow kind of, again, no one's nervous? Okay, green? Did I say green? Oh, wow, you, you're also, yeah, that's, you're sensitive. I can't talk to green or Okay. All right, and uh, okay, and then did I say, did I say a kind of, I don't even know what color that is versus purple. See, got to ask the kids, what, what would you say that color is? That's kind of a red. Maroon. Okay, if you're maroon, you are cool. Okay, cool as a cucumber, back to the 60s, all right? All right, and if you're black, it means you're moody, okay? <laughs> okay, so, all right? See, so now you all know how you're feeling for the day, right? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the blue, kind of the bluish, darkish gray was calm. Oh, you're calm. Well, I don't know, you may be kind of greenish there too, so you could be kind of on the sensitive side. Green, then there's blue, then there's black. Okay, so you're moody, calm, and sensitive. Whoa, okay. You are a mixture of emotions today here, okay? All right. So now what you want to do is, is you want to obviously have your ring and wear it every day so when you wake up in the morning, you know how you feel. And that'll just color how you feel the entire day, right? Does that make sense to you? Yes. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let me tell you why maybe that's not quite what our scripture lessons for today are kind of telling us. Today we have a scripture lesson that has this kind of a message in a very roundabout way about how oftentimes we as human beings get fixated on certain things. And when we get fixated on it, like you have a mood ring, and then suddenly I could be having the best day in the world, and it tells me I'm moody. And then I go, and then my mom would ask me, what's the problem? Well, my mood ring says I'm moody. <laughs> but you've been happy all day. Well, the mood ring says I'm moody. Okay? Oftentimes, we let things tell us things that really don't make any sense whatsoever. The point is, is you know exactly how, how you feel, right? Okay? So you don't really don't need a mood ring to tell you how you feel, do you? No? No, exactly. And our scripture lesson is telling us today to be careful with these kinds of things that can distract our attention. They're really great fun, okay, because they're really, really, uh, and guess what? You get to change these colors and the key to anything you want. So by the time you're in fifth grade or so, if it turns yellow, that means you like so-and-so. Whoa, right? See, that's what we used to do. Okay, and you can play whatever game you want, but it's just for fun. Okay, how you feel is inside of you, and you know exactly how you feel, and God knows how you feel, right? And, okay, so the final code we have here is that you all probably uh, have the one that indicates that you're upset with me for not bringing candy, right? 
Yeah, 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 I see all the nods, yes, yes, okay, all right. So just to alleviate that problem before we send you your way and to remind you not to get fixated on things, all right? All right. Okay, so, and, and there's a variety here. Okay, so you get to pick. And there's even, for those who don't like chocolate, there's stuff underneath, I think, that's not chocolate. Okay, all right. So before you go to class, let's just say a short together, uh, prayer together, all right? So dear God, we thank you for being, uh, this opportunity to be here in church today and for all the wonderful things that you share with us, mood rings and other fun things like candy that we have. Remind us not to get so fixated on those that we lose sight of everything else going on around us. Amen. One of the wonderful things of spending some time with our children here every Sunday morning is that when you see their faces, you have to understand, I wish you could just uh, have a camera that watched them, but the expressions of gratitude that they share with us are just incredible. Okay, children are very transparent about their feelings and they, you can tell when they really appreciate things. But we are now taking a moment now to just uh, speak of gratitude ourselves in our own lives. And as I mentioned, um, this Sunday is All Saints Sunday. And there have been so many people who have had an incredible impact, a very important impact on our lives. And so I'd like to just invite you now to just take a moment, and if you're comfortable and you want to, raise your hand and share with us the name of somebody who, uh, who is no longer with us, but who uh, very much had a very, very special and important impact in, uh, in your life. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. And let's just join together in a word of gratitude for those who've gone before us and who have had an incredible impact on our lives. Lord God, we just take a few moments away from our normal worship service this morning to acknowledge the fact that you have sent so many before us faithful servants who have guided so many people and provided excellent examples to us about how we should be living our lives and how truly we should also have faith in you. And so, O oh Lord, we are thankful for each and every person that we've mentioned and for those who we keep close to us in our hearts. O oh Lord, again, for their presence in our lives, for the opportunity to have intersected in their earthly journeys, for the fact that they're now at rest with you. O oh Lord, for the wonderful thoughts and memories that we have of them, we offer our thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, and so now we're just going to join together in our doxology, and then following that, we'll uh, pray in unison the dedication of the offerings that were brought today. Gracious God, you have provided for all of our needs each day. In recognition of your abiding grace and the abundance with which you bless us, we return to you a portion of the gifts you have shared us. Bless these offerings as well as the efforts of all those who do work in your name. May these offerings spread your love throughout the world and bring honor and glory to your name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so with those words in mind, might we take a moment now to share among ourselves and share with God some of the concerns and some of the joys from within the congregation this morning. Please leave a comment or send us an email with your joys and concerns, and we will pray for you. All right, so uh, let's now join together in silent prayer, and then I'm going to close with a collective prayer. Almighty God, before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are ever hidden, as we draw near to you in our worship and in our prayer this morning, we pray that you will keep us close to you and away from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast love and kindled desire, we may truly understand and better understand your will and your way. Lord, we acknowledge that we are 
part of the world in which we live. And in our world and in our lives, we have many, many concerns. And so this morning, O oh Lord, we pray for all those who are in need of your healing touch, wherever they are, in hospitals, convalescent homes, in their own homes. Remind them that you are with them through their journey, that truly, O oh Lord, we pray for an alleviation of their pain. And if it so be in your will, we pray for their recovery in the days ahead. Where you've brought recovery, O oh Lord, we are so thankful and pray that it will continue. We also uplift to you this day in prayer, O oh Lord, those who have recently lost a loved one. We've all walked that path and we know how difficult it is. And so, O oh Lord, in their times of grief, surround them with our love. Remind them that we continue to be with them. And O oh Lord, help them to realize that the loved one they've lost had a very special part in their lives. O oh Lord, we also pray for those who are walking through the valleys of shadows. For likewise, we too have walked through the valleys of shadows. And for us, all those who are feeling the pressures of the holidays, for those who are facing challenges that we cannot even imagine, O oh Lord, uplift each and every one of them into your loving light, that they may feel your presence and feel the hope that you bring to all of us in the deepest and darkest of our days. O Lord, we pray not only for ourselves and those who are close to us, but we pray for the world over this day, knowing that things just aren't the way they ought to be. And so, O Lord, help us not to lose the hope that we have through you that things can get better. Enable us to go forth into the world to be your hands. O Lord, even though the drum beats march us in a certain direction, help us to instead march toward Christ. O oh Lord, amidst all of these prayers of petition, we also have many, many joys, and so we are thankful for them. And so, O oh Lord, for all those events where we can celebrate, when we can watch our youth and our children participate in events, O oh Lord, when we are called to share our faith with others, for all the great things that are happening day in and day out, help, help us to make sure that we are aware of them that they're not overshadowed by the challenges we face, but rather that we acknowledge that truly you are present and there in our lives. And so again, for family, friends, and loved ones, we give thanks and pray for your blessings upon them. For all the creature comforts that you give us, we pray that you'll enable us to not worship those things more than we worship you. And finally, O oh Lord, for the fact that you enable us to always share with you in prayer, we offer our thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, and we're going to be reading from the 20th chapter, the 27th through the 38th verses. And just by way of introduction and context, you need to understand that there are about 25 chapters in Luke. So we're reading pretty much the end of the story of the Gospels, and every one of uh, the Gospels, at least Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we call the Synoptic Gospels, basically recount the uh, events of Jesus' earthly journey. So basically what we're talking about here is, is that we're at the end of Jesus' earthly journey here. And it's important to understand everything that's going on, to fully understand the passage, because otherwise, according to some commentators, today's scripture passage seems kind of irrelevant and hard to understand. So the context very much is this, is that Jesus has completed his journey to Jerusalem. Okay, so just before today's scripture lesson, we read about the fact that as he entered the city, uh, the streets were lined with followers and believers who chanted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, then after that, we read that Jesus wept for sorrow over Jerusalem's lack of understanding of God's will and for its imminent future. Not, not a very rosy picture there. Upon entering the city, Jesus goes to the temple, not to worship because he had any particular respect for what was going on there, but rather he went there to drive out those who were selling sacrifices and making change. 
Okay. Then Jesus stays in the temple to teach every day while his opponents seek the opportunity and the means by which to kill him. So we find ourselves in a very tense time in the Bible here. Jesus is at odds with the religious authorities at the time, and the tensions are just escalating, and they further escalate in this morning's scripture lesson. A group of Sadducees approach Jesus with a supposed question, and the supposed question wasn't really a question. They were hoping to trap him and be able to show, dis discredit him by Jesus' answer. So to understand what they're saying, you have to understand who they are and what they do. The Sadducees were one of the religious authorities of the Jewish people who had authority over the temple. They were kind of like, I don't know, we might call them modern day board of trustees, okay? From a theological perspective, they only recognized the five original books of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch. So that would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And uh, because in those five books of the Old Testament, there's no, no mention of a resurrection, the Sadducees do not believe in one. And this even placed them at odds with other Jewish people like the Pharisees who did believe in a resurrection. But because Jesus had cleared out the merchants and the money changers in the temple, attacked the sacrificial practices that were going on in the temple, the Sadducees were up against the wall and in their defensiveness, they put aside their differences with the Pharisees in an attempt to discredit Jesus with the question that's being posed in this morning's scripture lesson. They reference a law set forth uh, way back in the book of Deuteronomy, the requirement that a brother marry his brother's widow if that brother who passed away dies childless. And this was intended to obviously preserve the family name. But again, within this context, they decide to pose a question to Jesus about <clears throat> what happens or what it is like in heaven. And so now hear these words from Luke 20, verses 27 through uh, verses 38. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him, Jesus, and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, the first married and died childless. Then <clears throat> the second and then the third married her. And so, the same, all, in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry or are, nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of God of the resurrection, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all them are alive. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. For they no longer dared to ask him another question. There ends our reading. And may God add his understanding to our, uh, add to our understanding of those words. Now very often in our lives, the only way we can understand something is when someone kind of explains it in the context of our own experiences, okay? Sometimes we find that the best way to communicate and to get a message to another fellow human being is again, is to understand who they are and talk on their level, okay? So just recently, I had to go see a um, specialist, uh, an ear, nose, and throat specialist because I had through the summer, a series of nosebleeds. Some of you know, uh, if you were at the church at the Wildwood, unfortunately, uh, you witnessed the uh, first time that I had what I consider to be a pretty bad nosebleed. Uh, they kept occurring, and uh, as is so much the case now, it took me three months to get actually an appointment with a specialist to try to figure out what was going on. But anyway, so I went and saw this guy, and uh, he was a really good specialist, but he talked to me for a little while, 
and asked what happened. And then he kind of sized me up and he realized what kind of person I was. And he did a really good job. Surprisingly, I wasn't wearing a mood ring, so that's not how he figured out who I was. But he knew how my logic works. So he says, okay, so let me explain it to you this way. Okay, this is where you are today and you have a nosebleed. Okay, so in, 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 in a certain number of days, in five days, your nosebleed is in such a state or, or that, 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 that wound is in such a place where it's like having a piece of tissue paper over it. So that's where it is. You move another five days and that's 10 days out and now it's like having a piece of gauze. And then he says, move over five, another five days. And he does that and he says, finally gets to the fourth time and he says, okay, because he knows I'm a math kind of person, strangely enough. He says, okay, so how many days therefore from there to here does it take to, for your nose to heal? And I said, ooh, five times four, I got that answer. I'm getting all excited, 20, 20, 20. He says, okay, so you basically told me that every 14 days you were having a serious nosebleed and that you had seven serious nosebleeds. Okay, so he says, what's wrong with that? I says, nothing's wrong with that. That's what happened. He says, no, what's wrong with that is you had one nosebleed. It never healed because every time you, go, you don't go 20 days all the way to here and you have another nosebleed, you got to go all the way back to the beginning and he walks across from over there. And my simple mind then gets it. So he says, so I want you to understand, you only had one nosebleed. Stop freaking out. <laughs> okay? Okay. Like, you know, it's great. You always pay that $25 deductible to have some guy who's got a medical degree tell you to suck it up. He says, you wasted your money by going to the emergency room twice. What did they do when they went there? They told me to see a specialist. Yeah, right. They didn't do a darn thing, did they? No, they didn't. So why are you wasting money going to the... Stop freaking out over your nosebleeds and give your nose a chance to heal. And then he caught the religious part because he actually did hear me say that two of the nosebleeds happened when I was doing worship service. He goes, and God doesn't want you to have nosebleeds. God wants you to calm down and just let things heal. So it's great. So it's like mom's not here with me. She's one of the people I so much appreciate in my life. And now I pay $25 to hear a doctor tell me, just like my mom would say, suck it up and just get over it. But the point being is that oftentimes we have to hear things in a certain context. He couldn't just sit there. Because I had actually called my sister, who's a doctor, and she went through all of this, et cetera, et cetera. And she's kind of even more freaked me out because she said, oh, there is technology where they can do a vein transplant if they have to, blah, 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 in your nose. And I'm going like, whoa. (laughs) Uh, But he kind of sized me up and knew exactly the way I was and kind of put things into my own realm and understanding to help me understand what was going on. That is actually great when you're dealing with human kinds of things like that. The problem is oftentimes is we oftentimes use that same mode of operandus, uh, MO, to actually put God or stuff God into our own little box. And the message from this morning's scripture lesson is number one, is that we can't always do that when it comes to God's kingdom. Okay, so what was happening here is the Sadducees We're basically trying to take a situation and raise a question with Jesus that really had no understanding that God's realm is far beyond the box in which the Sadducees understood their world to function in. So it really had, it was totally illogical. Okay, so what happened there is, number one, first point for the day is we as human beings like to stuff everything into our own little world. Everything kind of revolves and works because of the way we think, okay? Uh, Nothing else exists if it doesn't exist the way I think of it or I believe it functions. And we have to have faith that in God's kingdom, things are much greater than we ever imagined or ever believed could be possible because that is the premise of our faith. And if we limit God, we are so much going to limit God's ability to change us and use us for the reasons he wants us here on the earth to be. And so again, it is so important that we not limit God to the understandings that we happen to have, but that we actually take a leap of faith every once in a while and say, I don't have to understand things a certain way when it comes to God's kingdom. That truly there is something that I can't comprehend, that I'm not gonna have an explanation for. It's so important. So that's point number one for this morning from our scripture lesson. Point number two is, as I was telling the children, sometimes we get very, very distracted by things that are going on around us, and we then totally lose perspective. And that's exactly what happened with the Sadducees. They were feeling so threatened by Jesus running out the change makers and the the sellers of the animals for sacrifice from the temple 
They felt so much that this was a black eye because they were the trustees, they were responsible for the building. They were the ones who were actually taking a commission from the change makers uh, that allowed them to have their booze in, in the temple, that they felt that they were losing face. And so it was that they found, uh, they felt that they had to go forth and find some kind of defense. Well, that happens to us probably in slightly different ways here in this modern world. One of the greatest things about the internet is that, at least for me personally, I can go online and find advice on how to do things or find solutions to problems that previously could have taken me years to figure out. So just about, if I want an answer to anything, boy, all I have to do is Google it, okay? Now, whether or not it's correct or not is the problem, and that's what the second message is all about. So recently, I had read on the internet that they're, that General Electric, but actually it's not General Electric, it's actually uh, some European company who uses the GE name to sell refrigerators, was recalling thousands of refrigerators because the handle on the refrigerators were loose and falling off. I don't know how that would injure somebody, but it was bad enough where the Consumer Product Safety Commission forced them to recall and fix these refrigerator door handles. Well, sure enough, guess what? In our kitchen is a GE refrigerator and the freezer door handle was loose. And so I was absolutely certain, based on everything I was reading on the internet, that we had one of those refrigerators that was being recalled. So I immediately go there and I actually, you know, because I can't see very well, you know, you use your cell phone, you use all this thing, you snap a, snap a picture of, of, the of, the, of the data plate, so it's got your serial number, et cetera. I get online and the internet and I put the number in and it says, your refrigerator is not part of the recall. It's like, what do you mean it's not part of the recall? I walk out and I pull the handle and it's loose and it's shaking. I'm going, that is part of the recall. It has to be. And I was so fixated on that for three months, I kept trying to figure out how I could get them to put my refrigerator into their recall. Okay? And then finally, when I just, they finally said no, your refrigerator is not part of the recall. That is not the problem. But I said, the problem is, is the handle is loose. And they said, how long have you had the refrigerator? Well, about four years. Your warranty was over in a year. This is not part of the recall. I finally realized that all I had to do was take a rubber mallet, tap the handle to the left, tighten the screw, tap the thing to the right, and the handle was totally tight again. But I was t so fixated on the fact that the internet, my God, it's like Jesus Christ came out for a second coming and told me that refrigerator is part of a recall. We get so fixated sometimes that we lose total sight of logic and we give up our human logic, okay? And so lesson number two from this is that's what happened to the Sadducees. And that is, so the message is, don't get so distracted by things like the internet. In other words, the, Google has not been codified as part of the New Testament, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Whether we think it or not, it's not the be all and the end all. God gave us a brain, but I certainly don't use it oftentimes because I'd rather go to Google, and Google tells me what the answer is. It's easier, okay? Think, okay? Step back for a moment. Don't just accept these distractions, okay? Don't let a mood ring tell you how you feel for the day, as telling the kids. Don't let Google tell you that your refrigerator is being recalled when it isn't being recalled, and it's a simple solution that you, all you got to do is tighten the screw and everything's okay again, okay? We make things out of nothing because we think or we're told that there are certain issues, okay? And third and finally, I just want to share with you this particular thought, and that is, is this morning's scripture lesson is a good example of why we have to learn to agree to disagree, okay? It's a funny situation here, but one of the problems, not only did they disagree, the Sadducees disagree with Jesus' position on them having change makers and, and people selling sacrifices at the doors of the temple, but they also disagreed vehemently with Jesus' position on the uh, resurrection, as did they vehemently disagree with the Pharisees, another group of Jews, about the same issue. But again, this is an example here of why can't people just agree to disagree, okay? We as First Church of Winstead, or you as First Church of Winstead, because I'm not your pastor anymore, but First Church of Winstead is an amalgamation, a union of Baptists and Congregationalists. Whether you realize it or not, theologically, Baptists and Congregationalists do not agree on baptism. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend the next hour here and just explain to you why the Baptists are right on baptism and that you are all wrong if you're a Congregationalist. Well, guess what? The congregation would empty out so fast it wouldn't be funny. So for over 100 years, I think, this church has been both 
American Baptists and United Church of Christ or Congregationalists, the members of the congregation have agreed to disagree. But oh my God, in today's political world, you have to be on one side or the other, and never can the two meet. And yet, for a hundred years, people in Winstead have come together and disagreed, oh my God, on the issue of baptism. Okay, is it infant baptism or is it adult baptism? Is it by immersion or is it by sprinkling? Or is it something in between? And yet, again, the message here from the scripture lesson this morning is, let it go. But there are certain things that you have to buy to, like basic tenets of Christian faith, but there are so many things in life where we can all be Christians and also disagree. Okay, so those who are driving Toyotas, you don't have to leave the parking lot because even though I put a sign out there this morning that if you don't drive a GM, get out of my parking lot, that's not valid, okay? It doesn't make any sense. There are a lot of differences that we're going to have, okay? So we can't just say that, okay, if you want to come to our worship service, you have to live on this side of Route 44 because if you live on the other side, those are all the snooty people with the bigger houses. So, you know, we don't want you here at our worship service. That's ridiculous, okay? We need to agree to disagree. It is okay to disagree. And had the Sadducees just agreed that they weren't going to see the eye to eye with the Pharisees, they weren't going to see the eye to eye with, with Jesus, maybe they wouldn't have looked so stupid as they did after they asked that ridiculous question to Jesus about the resurrection. But it's a reminder here that in our world, it's so uncommon these days, but there comes a point, there comes a time in life when you've got to agree to disagree, and it's okay to be friends, even though your friend may be a Republican or a Democrat or support X or Y or whatever, that it's okay. We have different perspectives. We, have different, we come from different walks of life. We have different experiences, and it's always great to listen as to why the other person has that perspective, and maybe we'll learn something from it, but it's not a reason to just basically say, I'm not going to talk to you, I'm not going to deal with you, or worse yet, I'm going to exclude you from my circle, or I'm going to harm you, hurt you, or hate you because of your views or opinions. Jesus is totally against that kind of thing. And again, Jesus' message is, maybe we need to learn to agree to disagree. So let's stop stuffing God into a particular box and, 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 and having God try to be uh, exactly the way we perceive God should be. Let us remember that we shouldn't get sucked up <laughs> into the internet and, and distracted so that we take illogical positions and arguments. And, and finally, let's just all remember that we need to take a breath and agree to disagree. And so as we gather around the Lord's table this morning and celebrate the Lord's Supper, let's remember that we're all different. We all have different perspectives. We're not going to agree on everything, but God loves each and every one of us. That is the message that we receive as we gather around this table this morning. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Oh, Lord God, Truly, you've given us a wonderful and diverse world, and yet somehow nowadays we want everything to be exactly the way we think it should be and exactly our way. Remind us that your kingdom is different. It's much broader. It's much more extensive. There are aspects of your kingdom that we are just not going to understand until we have the opportunity through the resurrection to be there. And so, oh Lord, help us to be more open-minded Help us to accept those who don't necessarily agree with us on all issues. Oh, Lord, help us to just take a deep breath and realize that it's okay to agree to disagree. And so as we gather around your table this morning, remind us that it doesn't matter where we come from, no matter what our walk of life is, it doesn't matter what our political opinion is, to you all are welcome at your table, even when we've made incredibly stupid mistakes in our lives. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. So our communion hymn this morning is number 330. Let us break bread together.
We now gather around the Lord's table to observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And I remind you all that this table of the Lord is open to all fellow Christians. Although none should partake of these sacred emblems in penitent or without faith in Christ, we as First Church of Winstead sincerely invite all who are sincerely seeking him to join around his table with the assurance that he who came into the world to be savior of all will in no ways cast any of them out. And so come now to this table, not because you must, but rather because you may. Come not to testify that you're particularly righteous, but truly that you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and love and desire to be Jesus' true disciple. Come not because you are strong, but rather because you are weak, and not because, again, that we have any particular knowledge or any particular uh, special standing within God's community, but rather that we are all just Christians standing together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so it is that oftentimes in our world, things seem to be out of control. We see that there's warfare and strife in our midst. There's poverty and racism and sorrow. Our broken world is oftentimes a, a symbolic of our broken relationship with God. And so it is at this table we are reminded that truly that all of those breaks can be mended, that truly there is hope, that truly this bread that we share, this wine and juice that we share, are symbolic of the fact that everybody who feels torn will find wholeness after this supper. And so therefore, as we were reminded from the scriptures that Jesus, when he was having his last meal with his disciples, took bread and after he had given thanks for it, then broke it and passed it amongst his disciples, and then they each shared of it. And Jesus said to them, take and eat this bread. And likewise, in the same way, Jesus also took the cup during the meal and gave thanks for it and then shared it with his disciples and all said, also said, take this, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And verily I say to you, I will no more drink of it until I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Let us join together in a word of prayer. Oh Lord, we're thankful for the fact that you are given us this opportunity to come around your table this morning. We pray that by the life and the death and rising again of your dear son, that we may receive now these sacred emblems in penit at penitent and also uh, <clears throat> with a pure heart, and, pure heart and a conscious undefiled, and that as we receive these without sin, that we may thereafter worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And so I will now invite you to come forward, gather your elements, return back, and then we will join together in sharing these elements. As you take and eat this bread this morning, be reminded of him whose body was broken for us and realize the suffering which will redeem the world in our time. Take now and eat of this bread. And as we share this cup this morning, I remind you of the words of John 3.16 where it is written, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that they who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so it is that each of you is a recipient of the benefits of the resurrection and eternal life. Take now and drink of this wine. Let us join together in our closing prayer. We praise you and thank you, O God, for this privilege to have been around your table this morning. We are grateful for the communion. And now as we go back into your world, May your grace accompany us, may your <clears throat> peace be our blessing, and may your kingdom's interests receive our first loyalty. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And our closing hymn for this morning is number 78, sent forth by God's blessing.
so now go forth into the world realizing that truly you have been blessed by God, that you've been redeemed by God, and that you've been promised eternal life. And with that hope, go forth into the world and change the world so that it is more of what God would have us have here in this earth. Go forth now and be God's people. Amen.